Welcome to the Gaelic Roots Lunchtime Series at Boston College. Gaelic Roots is sponsored by BC Irish Studies in collaboration with the Burns Library. These presentations can be viewed on the Gaelic Roots Facebook page with the option of a live chat or the Burns Library YouTube channel. Today, I'm excited to introduce Sligo fiddler Oshin McDermott, who I've asked to give a presentation on the legendary Sligo fiddler, Michael Coleman. Please welcome to the Gaelic Roots Lunchtime series, Oshin McDermott. Hello, I'm Oshin McDermott, a fiddle player from Sligo, and you're all very welcome to the Gaelic Roots series. Um, I'd like to thank Sheila Falls, Kyohan, um, for inviting me to do this performance and presentation uh, on the music of the amazing Sligo fiddle player, Michael Coleman. It's around 100 years since Michael Coleman began what was to become an extraordinary musical recording career, beginning in 1921. Michael moved from rural County Sligo, um, he grew up close to Calabal, uh, born in 1891, made the move to America in 1914, spent a couple of years um, performing on the vaudeville circuit before starting his recording career in 1921 um, with the tune you just heard there at the beginning, the Shaskeen Reel, which he paired with um, another lovely reel called the Bag of Potatoes. So we're going to start off uh, with that selection, which he recorded uh, on the Vocalin label in uh, released in April 1921. Coleman's recording career really got off to a flying start uh, in 1921. He recorded the, the Shaskeen um, selection for Vocalion um, probably as a, as a test run uh, to see how it would go down but the label were obviously very happy with how things went because Michael did a number of other recordings uh, for them in that year. He also recorded interestingly enough for a small uh, Irish one label uh, a label that was set up by Tom Ennis, the piper who had 
a music store in New York uh, on Columbus Avenue. Um, so this kind of marked, um, marked the beginning of Michael Coleman recording with a number of different labels over the years, some of them quite small and others that were very major uh, at the time. The selection he recorded for uh, Shannon Records, which is Tom Ennis's uh, label, uh, is a tune called, um, well, Tom Steele or Hand Me Down the Tackle is the, is the usual name for it. Um, it was known as Reedy Johnson's uh, on Coleman's um, recording and the second one is called Lawson's Favourite. One of the extraordinary things uh, about Michael Coleman's fiddle playing is just the ability that he had um, to play with such extraordinary melodic detail in the studio setting. Um, such a thing would be, you know, a, a, a marvellous achievement nowadays. But then musicians today are so much more comfortable and accustomed to the studio setting. Michael Coleman came from... Um, a musical environment in South County Sligo where music was certainly held in very very high regard uh, but the setting for it was much less formal and um, most music making taking place uh, in people's kitchens and in small houses where the community would gather for uh, to have a good time and to, to dance and share music and stories and things like that. Being suddenly thrust over in New York uh, in the early 20s with a new phenomenon such as the recording industry must have um, been quite a daunting um, thing for Michael Coleman to face but it, it sure doesn't sound like it when you listen to his recordings and of course we have to remember that up until 1925 Michael Coleman was not recording on his regular fiddle he had to use uh, what's known as a stroll fiddle uh, in the studio and the stroll fiddle was was a very useful uh, invention because in, in the pre-electric recording era it allowed a relatively quiet instrument such as a fiddle to be amplified using a metallic horn uh, which allowed for the music uh, to be captured and to be uh, recorded on disc which is very much a physical process and um, so you needed quite a loud acoustic sound to create those that wave energy uh, at that time so Michael had to play on this rather harsh sounding instrument uh, for anyone's ears um, so in some ways it's a miracle uh, that he succeeded so well in the studio and when we listen back to those recordings now um, more often than not I totally forget that he's playing a stroll 
fiddle such as is the amazing, amazing control uh, that he has. Moving on to 1922, and of course we're, we're skipping a lot of recordings here because we, we're, we, we have a certain uh, amount of time and he recorded 90 um, sides of music, or 90 discs uh, throughout his recording career, which is an, a phenomenal, phenomenal uh, achievement. In 1922, um, one of the uh, great selections of reels that Michael Coleman uh, recorded was uh, The Pigeon at the Gate and Miss Monaghan. So uh, he recorded this for the for another label, uh, the OK uh, label, uh, which was set up. Uh, it was a, a US um, a, a US version of a German uh, label, uh, and of course people were getting, um, you know, the labels that were emerging at that time were getting very interested in ethnic music because there was an incredible amount of newly arrived immigrants living, particularly in New York uh, at that time, and they certainly wanted to hear music from the homes that they left behind, and this was what interested the labels. Um, so here we go. Uh, these tunes, of course, would have been very commonly played, I'm sure, at the, at the time. Um, the Pigeon on the Gate and Miss Monaghan's. There's just so much to listen to um, in Coleman's playing and that's the remarkable thing that just you know brings you back time and time again um, to re-listen and to be re-inspired. Um, I don't think I've heard any other player um, that kind of pulls you back to listen um, over the years as Michael Coleman does. In, in some ways listening to his playing is a, is a lifetime's, I was going to say work, but you couldn't call it work. It's, a, it's very, very enjoyable for sure. But the amount of detail that he managed to pack into these versions of tunes and recordings of tunes that he played is just uh, hard to believe because um, in the recording studio in those days, you had one or two takes and that was it. You were also up, up against the clock because uh, the discs 
had only a certain time limit. You were in between three or four minutes. If you um, you could not exceed that time, and you can, in fact, sometimes hear in Coleman's recordings that he was pulling the brakes uh, on fairly fairly uh, rapidly towards the end, sometimes maybe finishing the tune where it wasn't meant to finish because obviously he was being told that they were running out of time on the disc. Um, so look, with all that going on, how he managed to uh, play with such incredible spontaneity, uh, it really is, I mean, it's a, it's a show, it's a showcase of what this music can be uh, at its finest. And as I said, um, it's, you know, you keep coming back and listening to Michael Coleman's because you think you've heard it all, but there's not a hope you've you've heard it all. Um, you know, every time you listen, you hear something different, and uh, really amazes me that one hundred years ago, uh, this music was being played at such an incredible level. Really extraordinary. Anyway, we're going to move on um, and keep moving through Michael Coleman's some of his recorded repertoire, um, a selection of jigs. He recorded so many incredible reels and um, the jigs he liked to play generally with them um, a very sprightly rhythm and um, you know pushing and emphasizing that first note staying in the first note it's a, a very common uh, stylistic trait amongst uh, Sligo musicians and it gives the the jig a lot of a lot of lift and he certainly didn't hold back the, the speed when he played uh, jigs maybe giving us a hint of um, his dancing background. He was a dancer, uh, of course, as well as a fiddler. And um, the same is true of the other maestro, um, Sligo fiddle player, James Morrison, uh, who also danced. So anyway, these are two jigs, the Temple House uh, jig, and uh, the second one is Apples in Winter. And uh, Michael recorded these in 1922. <laughs> couple of reels um, that are very very widely played um, to this day uh, are the Galway Rambler and the Copper Plate and these two tunes uh, were recorded under the name Wellingtons um, by Michael Coleman in 1923 and um, these two tunes are a great example of, of one of the lovely features of, of so much of the Sligo fiddle playing that that cross bowing and uh, that takes you in such a, a kind of a smooth and flowing way over the over the strings, over the D and the A string, uh, often in tunes that are, that are in the key of G major, as these two reels are. Uh, another one, another great example of that would be Lord MacDonald's 
uh, real. But anyway, these two tunes, um, another nice thing about the selection is the transition between going from the first tune to the second tune is kind of seamless because the second tune begins very much like the first tune does. So you're a little bit in before you realize that you have switched uh, tunes. And it's, uh, it makes me think of, uh, one of my favorite examples of that is a recording by um, Ben Lennon, the great fiddle player, and Tony O'Connell, concertina player. Um, they recorded a lovely selection uh, on an album a number of years ago. The Cavan Reel into the Galway Rambler. And um, again, the switch over between the two tunes, the beginning of the Galway Rambler is the very same as the second part of the Cavan Reel, so you don't notice that you've switched uh, for a little while. Anyway, here are uh, Wellingtons, our, um, the Galway Rambler, and um, the Copper Plate. Michael Coleman um, recorded many different types of tunes um, throughout his his vast recording career as well, um, mainly reels, but um, some of the other great tune types that he recorded were hop jigs, barn dances, hornpipes, flings, polkas. Um, so we're going to, we're going to play a, a hop jig selection now that Michael Coleman uh, recorded in 1925 for Columbia, and these two tunes are called. Uh, the Fox Hunter's Jig and Comb Your Hair and Curl It and uh, it's a really lovely a lovely uh, rhythm that the hop jig has quite different than a lot of our other uh, tunes.
Yeah, that's um, those tunes uh, as well. Um, you know, one of the traits that that Coleman, in fact, had in so many of his uh, of his tune versions was the use a use of a, a kind of a chromatic passing uh, note. It's really a, a feature of so many of his tunes where he introduces maybe a, a D sharp on the way up to an E uh, or a tune that has, you know, a tune that has C natural, he might introduce the C sharp or even the G sharp. Uh, it's a thing that gives a lovely color, color to his playing. It's just so, so creative uh, in, in, in what he does. And uh, it wasn't just a case of being creative once through a tune. It was like every time he played, he, he seemed to find something else uh, to pull into it. Whether it was spontaneous or planned, uh, we'll never know. But I mean, um, it would even if it was completely planned, it would still be in, uh, incredible. But it's, it, it just seems so uh, spontaneous when you listen to it. It's, it's extraordinary. We're, we're going to move on now to, um, we're all the way up to 1926. Uh, and another label, uh, a very interesting one comes into the mix here, and uh, that was started by Leitrim woman Ellen O'Byrne. Uh, De Witt, she was married to a, a Dutch immigrant, and um, like Tom Ennis, she had a music shop in New York and very much saw that the potential for recording traditional Irish music. She saw that the, you know, some of the songs were being recorded, uh, but there wasn't there wasn't really any uh, recording of uh, instrumental music. This was back back before Michael Cohen. This was around 1916, uh, and I suppose patriotic fervor was at its height as well. And people were were very much aware of uh, Irish culture and, and Irish nationalism uh, at the time. Anyway, Ellen was uh, a very forward thinking uh, and entrepreneurial uh, lady, and she convinced Columbia Records. Uh, at the time to record, to give instrumental Irish music a chance, you could say, she offered to buy uh, the first 1,000 uh, discs that they printed uh, and in, in so doing she basically uh, convinced them to give it a go and uh, it, it worked out uh, extraordinarily well. Anyway, Michael uh, and many others recorded uh, some uh, selections for her uh, label over the years and this is, uh, in 1926 Michael recorded um, a very, very famous uh, jig the old grey goose which is a, a beautiful long piece of music so I'll only play this uh, once but it's one of the jigs that's definitely become very f synonymous uh, with the playing of Michael Coleman <laughs> Very next year, then 1927, um, probably marked the height of Michael Coleman's recording career because he was in really prolific form, a little bit like 1921. Um, he recorded a number of really wonderful uh, selections of music. Some, for some of them, he was reputedly paid quite a lot of money as well, uh, which is uh, great to hear. Um, the Donegal fiddler and friend of, of Michael's uh, Huey Gillespie said that 
Coleman was reputedly paid $500 for recording uh, Lord MacDonald's, uh, which he recorded in 1927. So this is one of the, the, the very, very famous selections of tunes associated with Michael Coleman that's still played nowadays. Lord MacDonald's, wh wherever you hear Lord MacDonald's, you're bound to hear the band is slow, fair, after it and that is exactly how Michael Coleman recorded it in 1927 for Victor. The last recordings of Michael Coleman before the infamous Wall Street crash of 1929 which really put an end to so much of the recording industry in America. The last track that he recorded uh, in 1929 was a beautiful uh, expressive barn dance called Mrs. Kenny's uh, which is a lovely lonely feel uh, about it. Incidentally on the piano um, for this particular recording was Herbert Henry, who um, was said to be a, re uh, a relation of the Sligo Henrys, Kevin Henry and Johnny Henry and Verona um, and family, uh, great musicians here in the Sligo area and of course Kevin was in Chicago for so many years but uh, Herbert seemingly a relation of the, of the Henrys. So nice uh, Sligo link for this particular track.
And it would be 1934 and 1936 before Michael Coleman recorded. Um, one of the very famous selections that Michael Coleman recorded in 1934 was the Reels Bonnie Kate and Jenny's Chickens. We'll try a selection of jigs now and again these jigs are a very very popular uh, selection played in Sligo to this day and um, these are jigs called Tell Her I Am and the second one is known as Richard Brennan's recorded in 1936 uh, on the Decca label. Thank you. 
Well, there were a number of other Coleman recordings which came after the end of his official um, commercial recording career. There are some recordings made in New York in 1940 uh, which were made um, for a Chicago uh, man, James Carroll. And um, these are private recordings recorded in the studio um, for a collector. And um, one of the beautiful tunes obviously is coming about five years now from the um, from the end of Coleman's life, but um, he was still playing um, to an extraordinarily high level. Um, one of the tunes that was recorded in 1940 in that studio session uh, was a beautiful reel called Malloy's, and it really shows Coleman at his expressive uh, best. So much expression uh, still in his music, so much to give. And the last recordings uh, that we have of Coleman come from 1944. He did a radio, um, a radio recording. He was living in Newark uh, at the time, in the middle of the Second World War. He was working uh, out there, and um, he made some radio acetates for the World Broadcasting Company, which were then sold on to to other um, radio stations around America, and. Um, these were not obviously commercially recorded, um, but they're, you know, the recordings are still in existence, and um, it's amazing to hear Coleman just at the very end uh, of his life still playing with so much expression, you know, some of the power that confidence uh, of the early or earlier Coleman uh, is not there uh, anymore, but the beauty, um, the expression. Just that haunting quality which he had um, in so many of his recordings uh, is, is still there. So um, I'm going to play one of the tunes uh, that was recorded in that session and it brings us back to one of the musicians I mentioned at the beginning and that was Johnny Gorman, uh, the piper from Roscommon who gave so much music to Sligo musicians and one of the tunes that Coleman recorded in those last recordings was Gorman's Barn Dance, uh, a beautiful, beautiful little tune. And um, we'll finish off with that, but before uh, before we get to that tune, um, I'd like to again thank Sheila Falls, uh, Kyohan, and um, the Gaelic Roots series of Boston College for, uh, for giving me an opportunity to delve back into Coleman's uh, work and revisit it. As I said, it's, um, it's something that 
that that is so enjoyable to do very very regularly because um there's an incredible um incredible collection of material that he recorded it's it's really huge body of work and uh, what he did to the tunes would take so long to 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 take in that it's uh, definitely worth a uh, repeated listing and um i think coleman to be fair continues to to be held up and rightly so as uh, an example of probably the finest that can ever be done on the irish fiddle um he really showed uh showed us all the beauty that's in this music uh, and the potential for individual creativity that's uh, in so many of these tunes and he expressed that to the full uh, in his musical uh, life and um, we are continually inspired and I think people will be inspired for many many years uh, to come. In terms of um, in terms of accessing this music has become a lot more accessible um in you know in recent times in digital times it's easier to get a hold of this a lot of the a lot of this music is out there uh, on the internet on youtube and uh, people can listen to it freely um back when i was uh, growing up and um you know in the in in the stages of learning learning the fiddle um you know one of one of the people that really made an enormous contribution in terms of making this music accessible was harry bradshaw uh, Harry uh, spent many many years collecting this music of Coleman and many others James Morrison uh, and other greats of the 20s and 30s and remastering cleaning up this music interviewing people those who were still alive to try and piece together the stories uh, and um, we're very grateful for, for Harry and others who have done this uh, very valuable archival work I know Boston College uh, and the Burns Library are very very keenly aware of the importance of archival uh, work and have the wonderful Seamus Connolly uh, archive there. Uh, this is a, a jewel of a collection for those that like the, the CD format uh, released by Gaelin. Um, and this is Harry Bradshaw's uh, work back uh, in the 90s. And um, Harry at that time went around the country to a lot of the summer schools in Ireland giving lectures, wonderful lectures about these musicians. And uh, it was through those lectures that I very much got drawn into that's uh, the, the music because it was the way he told the story and the, the beautiful context he gave this music you know as a youngster really really gripped me so uh, I, I'd like to, to compliment Harry his wonderful work uh, that he's done to, to make this and uh, one of my former fiddle teachers Paddy Ryan as well it was always a great a, a, a great person to to keep reminding people of the the great old music uh, that is out there and that is so rewarding to listen to. Anyhow, thank you for listening and we'll finish off uh, with Johnny Gorman's uh, Barn Dance.